Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to see you all here. As a president of the Royal Dublin Society, I want to welcome you to our annual Gold Medal for Enterprise Award. Um, I would especially like to welcome our guest of honour, Brian McCarthy, along with his family, friends and colleagues. Today we award Brian the Society's highest honour for enterprise. To be considered for the gold medal, the individual must have shown exceptional leadership and have an outstanding track record in business achievement, which has contributed to sustainable economic development in Ireland. Brian McCarthy's record of achievement marks him out as one of the most important and influential figures in Irish business over the past 40 years. His dynamism and vision have transformed Fexco into the remarkable Irish and indeed international success story that we know today. The RDS has been sharing ideas and shaping Ireland's economic and cultural development for close on 300 years. Today's award is just one way in which we continue to do this. In Brian, we find someone who has lived the values of the RDS and whose work reflects the mission of the organisation. So if I may present to you the encomium of Brian McCarthy. One of Ireland's most respected and admired business leaders, he is an internationally renowned and highly successful businessman, multiple award winner, philanthropist and champion for the development of rural Ireland. Brian is considered a role model for all Irish entrepreneurs for the example he has set over his long and distinguished career. As a young man, Brian uh, joined the Munster and Leinster Bank, which later amalgamated with other banks to form AIB. He served in Cork and Dublin before moving to Kilorgan, County Kerry in 1974. He quickly worked his way up the ranks, gaining the respect of his colleagues and local businesses in Kilorgan. In the late uh, 70s and early 80s, uh, banking hours were uh, pretty restrictive and um, seeing tourists constantly queuing at the bank for foreign exchanges gave him an idea. He seized an opportunity and founded Fexco in 1981. Celebrating this year 40 years in business, Fexco is now a truly global success story, employing over 2,500 people worldwide. While still headquartered in Kilorglan, Fexco operates in 29 countries around the world and has grown and evolved to deal with a rapidly changing global financial services sector. In addition to Brian's business achievements, I also want to recognise his important philanthropic work and public service work, which sets him apart. Brian has given considerably of his time and his talents to the future of Ireland. He's a champion for rural Ireland and has campaigned for the availability and constant renewal of vital infrastructure in areas such as Kilorglan. He is a founding trustee and former chairman of the Irish Pilgrimage Trust, which brings children and young people with special needs on annual pilgrimages to Lourdes. Brian has a, a long association with the University College Cork, is a former member of the UCC Foundation Committee, He's also a former director of Radio Kerry and served as chairman of the prisons board of the Irish Prisons Authority for 12 years. In 2020, Fexco announced a 21 million euro investment in the development of a new technology and research hub in conjunction with Munster Technological University and Kerry County Council. The this innovation hub will offer ambitious fintech entrepreneurs the space and the investment needed to succeed, again demonstrating Fexco's commitment to the future of the sector and to the local area. Brian McCarthy stands among the great names of business, one of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs, an inspiring but unassuming person with a clear vision and a determination to succeed. I hope that this gives you some sense of the career and achievements of Brian McCarthy and the impact he has had. Uh, I look forward to 
learning more about Brian as well as his insights and his thoughts on our economic future as he sits down for interview with our host, Richard Curran. But first, I would like to call on Brian McCarthy to join me here, please, as I present him with the RDS Gold Medal for Enterprise for 2021. I just want to say a, sh a few short words of how honoured and privileged I am to be uh, the recipient here of this wonderful award from the RDS. I want to thank everybody who was involved in making it possible. I never expected to be here in, in my whole life. I never thought there would be such an occasion like this, but we are here now and I thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to uh, have an opportunity to, uh, to meet Brian McCarthy, someone who uh, I have uh, watched from afar as a business journalist for many years, but we never actually met prior to this and uh, I've, I've watched on with awe at times at the success of the company and what you've done and some of the deals that you've done. It'd be nice to actually have an opportunity to talk about some of them. But first of all, you said there you wanted to thank everybody uh, for the award and you, you never necessarily expected a day like this in the RDS. What, what does winning an award like this mean for you in terms of getting this kind of recognition? Well, as I said earlier, I never expected to have an award like this, but now that I have it, I appreciate it as being one of the things that very few people have it in this country. And I accept it for what it is, a unique award by people who are in authority in Ireland. And I thank you so much for it. Right. And when you hear, Brian, somebody list off, as Owen did, some of the things that you've done and about the business and, you know, processing 14 billion euro of transactions in treasury and digital tax operating in 29 countries, Two and a half thousand employees, all of these things. Are you taken aback at times by what you've done in terms of when you started the business and what your plans were? Yeah, well, it's like every other startup business. You never expect to see the day when something like this grows to that size. But it, it couldn't, it wouldn't happen because I was there alone. There were many more who, who uh, contributed to it and still do to this very day. And they're the loyal people who work for us. They're wonderful. What about back to the start? You're so closely associated with Calorglan. Um, your, your name and the business name and everything goes hand in hand with the town and the area and, and in such a strong way. But you're actually born in Dublin. Yeah. And left Dublin at a very young age, an early age. What yeah. age were you? Three, yeah. Three? You don't remember it, I suppose. <laughs> Only on the train to Cork. <laughs> The, fa the fast train out, that's what that sounds like. <laughs> and you, you would have, your childhood then was really spent in Cork. Yeah. Uh, Kilorglan came along through, through your career in, in Yeah, Bank. well, I was in Dublin for uh, five years here uh, at the formation of AIB. And I suppose they were the uh, years that made the most difference to me personally. I saw, it, I saw the way the world was changing at the time. I saw what needed to be done to get things right. And I think we had a fairly free hand at the time to, to, make, to make changes in the way the three banks work together and all that kind of thing. And I'm happy to have been part of that. So when you went to Kilorglan then, what was your view or your plans or your intention at that stage? Did you think, you'll, I'll do a few years here and then I might move on somewhere else? Because your dad had been uh, in banking as well yeah, and would yeah, have moved around? Well, to be honest, uh, Richard, I was sent to Kilorgan for training. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in, in branch banking. And uh, it was my first uh, time, the first time I, I had uh, any uh, connection with a small town. And uh, I found Kilorgan to be a wonderful place. And so there, Mary and myself set up house at that very time. 
And at some point then, you're in the bank, you're in Kilorgan, you like it there, but somewhere along the line, you, you, you've, you've got an itch to set up a business uh, of your own. And the, the, sure. the bank strike sort of presented an Well, that was one thing, but uh, I suppose my experience had been in foreign exchange in, in the bank. And when we had a break with Sterling in 1979, I think that was, uh, that meant Sterling was a foreign currency. And it, made, it almost uh, doubled the amount of foreign currency in circulation in Ireland at the time in the summer. But on for, uh, the banks that time, and even to this day, only open four hours a day and weren't open on weekends or bank holidays. So they couldn't supply the needs of tourists especially in a region like Kerry. And it, it was a, a disgrace, I thought, that this should continue to happen. But then the central bank uh, issued permission for somebody, people interested in foreign exchange to provide those services uh, on, a, on, a, on a kind of, uh, you, on a just purchase only basis. You, had, you, you could only purchase foreign exchange, you couldn't sell it. But on that basis, you were given the permission to open up, and I thought it was good enough. Um, and at some point then, the decision comes to, to leave the job, and that's a big decision for anybody really, isn't it? You know, especially in banking yeah. at that time, it was a very secure job. Did you have any qualms, or were you nervous about that when that moment Well, I suppose uh, there were always issues about whether, whether it would work or not. But what, what made it kind of attractive to me was that the central bank allowed the company that, that was there already to uh, open up branches or sub offices, uh, maybe that's what you call them, in other, in other uh, places. And when that happened, the, the, spread of, the spread of opportunity was much wider than it was just in, in, in Killarney or Cloglin. And that was what, what really triggered the whole thing. So, what were the early days like in terms of, I'm thinking about, when you think about banking today and communications and telecommunications and technology, what was it like? Oh, uh, we had just got a, an automatic... You sound like you're still exhausted from a prime. <laughs> <laughs> we had just got an automatic exchange in Kilorgan at uh, that time. And uh, remember, that time, there was no such thing as uh, internet or mobile phones or anything like that. But one of the things that was important was that uh, the tourist offices around the country volunteer to open the Bureau de Change for their customers. But they were all connected by uh, telex. And we had a telex you know, system in, 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 in our um, port of cabin, in, in our house in Kilorga. And that, that Headquarters. Headquarters, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was an easy way to get out the rates every day to all these places. This was done on the phone. So uh, it, was, it was slow, but effective. And I suppose that, that was a, something that made life a little easier. Mm. And then uh, along the way, there would have been key, key moments or milestones in the development of the business. One of the big things would have been the whole area of VAT refunds. Yeah. And uh, I can talk about some others in a moment, but because that, that allowed you to get into a whole other area and then the UK as well. Yes, well, we, we did have our, our bureaus mostly in tourist shops, as I say, tourist offices. And uh, those tourist shops used to uh, deal with Americans mainly. And in 1970 or 78, I think, and two, uh, there was a, an, um, an agreement with the European Commission that all countries in the EU would. would, would uh, give uh, refunds of the VAT on goods brought out of the EU by, cost by customers who didn't come from there. And that, in Ireland, that meant that mostly Americans who were visiting here in the summertime could get a refund of that on what they bought here, which they couldn't do before. But the funny thing was that most of the shops we were dealing with them didn't know how to, to get back this money and used to send out Irish pound checks to America for maybe smallish amounts. <coughs> and, uh, and the minimum charge in American, an American bank for clearing an Irish pound check was $40. 
<laughs> so that wasn't going to work. So it was a problem that had to be solved. And you had the solution. Yeah. Yeah. And also then, at one point, uh, was it on the VAT returns that Harrods, the store in London, became a customer as well? Didn't oh, yes. Well, well that, that idea extended our credit. He grew to be more than checks. We were able to make transfers using credit cards. And uh, we, we uh, I wonder, uh, shortly after that, tried to, to expand our business to the UK on our own. And we found that Bank of Scotland were also interested in this business in, in Scotland. And we had a joint venture with Bank of Scotland in the UK then, uh, jo jointly owned by, by ourselves and Bank of Scotland. And through the Bank of Scotland, we became, uh, our clients became, one of our clients became Harrods of London, which was probably the best known store in the world. And the amount of business that they did Astronomical. You, you got to see how much was really being spent on the handbags and all of oh, that, yeah, did yeah. you, Brian? Well, John Nake is here tonight. He was the man who was over there at that time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, another whole business area then that opened up was the contract for prize bonds. And yeah. was, that, uh, was that difficult to win that contract, you know, yeah. as well as... I, I presume a lot of it was a paper-based system at that time. Yes. But, the issue here with, with us was that the computer system that we had for making refunds of VAT had become overburdened by what the amount of business we were putting into it. So we had to buy a bigger computer. At that time, you had to buy a mainframe computer to get bigger than what one we had. And that was, cut, that was something close to around two million. And uh, at that time, was a fort, couldn't, couldn't afford it. But then we found that the, the, uh, the Bank of Ireland had uh, told the government that they hadn't the resources to, compu uh, to computerise the prize bond system. And we, we uh, tendered to the Department of Finance for, for the prize bonds at that time. It after become, became the NTMA. But uh, we, we, they gave us the job. And I think it was a big risk by those who were there in the Department of Finance that time. So we, one day uh, in Kilogram, we had 11 and a half million documents from Dublin delivered to us. Arrived down? Yeah. Five lorries. Five lorries. <laughs> 11 and a half million documents. Yeah. I, won't, I won't ask you, did any go missing because... <laughs> no. no. Because we balanced the fund afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so you knew straight away. Um, it's interesting as well, you, you've done some extraordinarily interesting deals. Two that come to mind was the, the, the relationship you had with Western Union and their parent, First Data. And First Data ended up taking a stake in the company. Yeah. And then they ended up buying back their franchise and cancelling out that shareholding. So you found yourself in a very good position from those two deals. And then more recently, in 2010, after the financial crash, you saw an opportunity to buy good buddy stockbrokers. Yeah. And of course, we've seen now recently, you've sold it back to uh, AIB again. How do you manage to spot, to come out the right side of, <laughs> of these kind of transactions? Uh, no, Richard, we have to start at the start. Our, our, our um, main business, with Western Union was actually, we got a franchise from them to, to put the uh, Western, Western Union uh, system into all of our bureaus, which we had around 300 at the time, I think, in Ireland. And uh, that worked very well. But we discovered that they didn't have a system for managing sub-agencies and our software people, some of them are here today, put together a uh, a system to do to manage sub agencies, and it worked very well, and it worked very well for Western Union, and we were able to uh, set up sub agents in, in Spain. At one stage we had uh, 5,000 agents in Spain, and then we had them in uh, Nor uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark and Finland, and we had thousands of agents up there too, and in the UK we bought the UK from them. So uh, we became the biggest agent in the world outside of um, 
America for Western Union. And they, they wanted to get back charge of it, control over all their agency network, because we were running them. And we did a deal. As part of our world, you know, we do deals. Uh, <laughs> and it, it proved to be a very good deal. It was a good deal, yeah. And it gave us cash. Because yeah. remember, we never had capital. Nobody invested ever, ever, ever invested money in our company. But by these various um, issues, we, we, we became, uh, we had enough cash to do other things, like buy computers and buy other companies, etc. The other deal that I was going to ask you about was uh, Good Body and AIB. Back in 2010, we've had the financial crash, the banks are in trouble, the country's in trouble. There's a view and an atmosphere at the time that we're going to be in trouble for at least 10 years or 15 years at the time. There was a real sense of that. You obviously didn't believe that because you saw an opportunity with good bodies. Was it your idea? Did you approach, approach them and say? Uh, well, Richard, we had a problem ourselves because we had a stockbroking company ourselves. And we, we were, uh, it wasn't making any money at the time. And we were told to, to close it down. Well, we didn't have much experience with closing down a stockbroking company. And we said, if, would it be possible to uh, amalgamate it with the uh, AIB one, which was being forced to be so, sold by the government? And uh, that particular idea worked out, and we became owners of our companies. And then, of course... And we, and we, and we transferred our own stockbroking company into it. Right. And was that an idea that just sort of came to you at one point? This, this is a solution here to this problem? This is a way through it? A kind of combination of events, I'd say, and, and, and one idea ever. Yeah. Mm. And then, of course, you did a very good deal in selling it back to AIB. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know whether it was that good. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, but it wasn't good enough, was it? <laughs> <laughs> and, Inevitably, you talk about the 11 and a half million documents arriving down in Kilorglan and all that. Kilorglan has been the centre point, the hub, you know, for you, for your life, for the business. Um, it's, were you ever tempted to, to say, you know, I'll, I'll move to the IFSC. Let's do the whole IFSC thing. No, it was never. The IFSC never had that attraction for us anyway. Because mainly as a, because of our, our uh, dedicated staff that we had working for us, who had made it, made everything happen, and, and uh, were, were reliable in, in every every sense of the word. So moving to IFSC would make no sense, or any that kind of thing. We're very happy to be where we are. And it's extraordinary that you've built a global business from Kilorglan, and then you have the impact that that has had on that immediate area as well as the impact um, you know, that it's had on, uh, on entrepreneurship as well. Because within Fexco, you know, more recently, you've set up uh, a hub there for smaller businesses to, to yes. develop and grow. That's something that's very important to you. Yes, because uh, we believe that every business begins, uh, every, every small business begins with a number of people coming together in, in some of the place where they can share resources with each other. And this idea of having a hub in Kilorgan connected to our IT department was something which, which appealed to me big time. Yeah. And, and it's, I think it is still is a, a key issue. Mm. Are you an optimist, Brian, by nature? I always used to say that if, if you're a glass half empty person, you'll do well in journalism, and if you're a glass half full person, you'll do well in business. Are, are, are you, are you, I know I'm a glass half empty, but are, are, you, are you an optimist? Are, are you optimistic about Ireland and where it's at now in the future? Of course I'd be optimistic. I think we have a very good uh, educational system in this country. I think we're one of the best in, in Europe, if not in the world, in terms of our, our, our um, uh, system of education. Well, I think is how, how we keep those people in this country working together on, on useful projects is, is how the success is always going to be measured in the future. And that's as much about education and the education system education. and tailoring that? 
Yeah. Yeah. And the future of financial services, it's, it's at a real fulcrum of change now. We have the traditional banks, we have the fintechs, we have all of these things. Are, what do you think the future looks like in financial services? Can I use the word mystery? <laughs> I, I, I just don't know, don't know myself how the whole thing is going to pan out now as, as we become more and more uh, dependent on the internet. Would you be worried about that, that there's an over-dependence on, on cloud you know, and data yeah. for retaining vital information? Well, uh, by nature, I suppose I'd be very careful about having all my eggs in one basket. Mm. And um, I think the danger with the uh, internet and with the cloud and all that kind of stuff is that there, there is one, one system that runs the whole thing. That's very dangerous. In my view. Yeah. You don't sound like someone who's invested a lot in Bitcoin recently. <laughs> Are you, what do you think of cryptocurrencies? Oh, I, I don't think we'll do it. We, we've done it before. Now will we do it in the future? <laughs> yeah. No, that, that wouldn't be a, a, a policy I would I recommend to our board of directors. <laughs> 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 and so you're, you're, you're not a fan of cryptocurrency. No. Do, do you think there's a chance it might all come crashing down? Do you think it's something that regulators should be looking at? Very dangerous. Because, again, we don't know who, who manages it, who owns it. Uh, what, what are the rules that govern it? We don't know those things. And I don't think anybody does. Mm. Well, uh, the danger is when... when, when, when uh, any system depends on something like that, that something could happen. Mm. And I don't think uh, the kind of results could be disastrous for a whole lot of people. When you look back, you know, 40 years, Fexco, if you were starting again, was there, is there anything you'd do differently? I should, I couldn't imagine what I'd do differently, no. Mm. Especially being here with, a, with the uh, medal from the RDS today. <laughs> <laughs> and are you a worrier? During the, during the years when you were building up the business, I'm sure there were many good days, some bad days, days when you might have been worried. What would, what would keep you awake at night? Or would anything keep you awake at night? No, oh, it was... Uh a matter of getting up very early. You didn't have time for sleep. So uh, you wouldn't be asleep at all. So you're not, you're not a worrier by nature? No, no, not really, no. And people talk about entrepreneurship and they say it's something that people have. They say it's something that can't be taught. Some people say it is something that can be taught. What do you think? No, I, I don't think this is a, an, an issue that can be described. Uh, I suppose... Opportunities are things that certain people see and other people don't. And people who see them might be called entrepreneurs. People who see them and take them up are definitely entrepreneurs. But it's, how do you, how do you recognize an opportunity that's, that, may, that is substantial and makes some, make some difference? That's the most important thing. And if you had a piece of advice for someone today starting out in business or in a startup company of their own, what, what advice would you give them? Get lucky. Get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do you think you make your own luck? Yeah. You do. You believe in making your own luck. I don't even know that in it, yeah. Well, Brian, I, I'm sure maybe along the way there was bits and pieces of luck came into it but I somehow reckon you definitely made your own luck in what you have done. <laughs> and thank you very much for uh, talking to us today. And congratulations again. Thanks very much.